There's two sermons that uh, pastors always hate to preach. The first one is tithe, because pastors just hate asking for money. I don't have that problem. The other song, <laughs> the, the other sermon that pastors hate to preach is the topic of sin. Again, I don't have that problem. Um, I think sin is one of the most important topics we can approach as we understand what is this thing we call the gospel. If we don't rightly approach the topic of sin, then we won't understand the beautiful realities of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's very important that we understand it and we, we approach it humbly and with grace because there's, there's one danger is that we will we'll say, oh, sin's no big deal. Well, Jesus died to prove that wrong. Sin is a huge deal. Or the other thing is, is we'll start throwing our each other against the sin, the rocks of sin and, and an attempt to destroy and damage each other with the truth of the reality of our brokenness. And my desire is that, not that we would, um, in a sermon like this, that we would be thrown against the rocks of sin and destroyed, but instead we would see what Jesus took on our behalf so that when we look at the cross, we see how beautiful it is and how desperately we need the Savior. Without understanding sin, we cannot understand the cross. And one of the dangers is, is when we're doing sermons or messages on sin, there's a tendency to go, oh, I know who needs to hear this sermon. And to Jimbo and Larry and, and Mike and, and Billy Bob, and you, you start listing off, I just was making up names. If you had a name in that list, I apologize. But <laughs> you just start making, you know, like you're thinking about all the different people who need to hear the sermon. But in reality, when we hear a topic like this, we should be saying, oh, I know who needs to hear this sermon. Pastor Sam needs to hear this sermon. We need to point at ourselves. We need to say, I need to hear this sermon. I need to hear the, the truth and the horrifying realities of sin so that when I look at the cross, I see how beautiful my Lord and Savior is. So, so my hope is, is that long before you say, hey, I know who can get, I, I'm going to email the uh, the YouTube copy of this sermon to somebody so that they can listen to it. I want it to be, how is God informing your heart as you listen to the words that we're going to read today? The other part of this is it's, it's a continuation of this sermon series that we're going through, is that we're looking at sin, confession, and life together. Because as we looked at last week, we looked at the beautiful glory of God and the, the beautiful price he prayed so that we could enter into his glory despite the fact that we are marred and broken by sin. And as we approach sin and then as we look at what the Holy Spirit does through us to make us whole and we confess our sins to one another, we draw nearer to each other in community. My hope is that we would be a community that is not afraid of the truth that we are sinners saved by grace and that we help each other walk in that path of sanctification, being made holy like Jesus is holy. That we walk along each other when we, when we have broken moments, when we have sick moments, when we have moments where we need each other. Because we cannot do this life alone. Ultimately, this will be, about, will be drawn in through the course of this summer into how do we live out the truths of the gospel in community as a church as a community of God who cries out, Maranatha. So then, we need to ask the question, what is sin? As a chaplain and as a pastor, I don't often get the question, pastor, is X a sin? And I know I've said this before. They say, is X a sin? If I do this thing, is this a sin? And, and really what people are saying when when they ask that question, is X or Y a sin? They're, they're essentially saying, if I do just enough bad things, what, what bad things can I do and still get into the kingdom of heaven? Like, what is just that balance between good and bad so I can get it leveled out just right so that, so that I don't have to worry about getting into the kingdom of heaven? It's, it's very similar to the uh, rich young ruler who came up to Jesus in Luke 18 who said, what, what can I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? 
And Jesus says, sell all you have and give to the poor. He was really saying, where is your ultimate treasure? He was saying, what is your ultimate treasure? Is it God or is it the things of this earth? And the rich young ruler went away because it was the things of the earth. And so what I want us to look at today is sin isn't a list of good and bad deeds that we do. There's a part of it that's that, but, but there is something much deeper. And so I kind of break it down into two categories. There is capital S sin, singular. This is the big category of sin. Capital S sin at its core is a corruption of our thoughts and passions towards God. And this is something that started in the garden. When Adam took that first fruit and he, he took a bite of it and, and put himself in the place of God, sin entered into the world. And from Adam to us, until Jesus returns, sin will remain in the world. And, and so at the core of sin is a corruption of our desire and passion towards God. We, we want to put ourselves in the place of God as opposed to worshiping the one true God who created us to be in relationship with him. And then what flows out of that corruption is what I call lowercase sins, plural. And the lowercase s sins are the fruit of those actions. So the corruption of the heart is the roots of the tree and the actions are the fruit of the tree. So that when we covet, when we are mean to somebody, when we cheat on our taxes, when we do X, Y, or Z, those are the fruit of sin. And whenever anybody says to me, you know, is X a sin, really what they're saying is, is this a fruit of sin? And everything that's not um, drawn from healthy roots of Jesus Christ is ultimately corrupted by sin. And, and so a tree that does not have healthy roots cannot produce good fruit. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look into Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 18 to 32, but we're going to start and go all the way to verse 28, and then we'll read the rest of it in a little bit later. But let's uh, start there. We'll start at Romans 1, verses 18, and we'll read to verse 28 to start. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who by their unrighteousness suppresses the truth. For what can be, made, what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature, has, clearly perceived, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For all they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their heart, to the impurities, uh, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations with, uh, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Commen men committed shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, they, God gave them up to the debased mind to do what ought not to be done, and uh, to do what not ought to be done. That's the end of 28. So to understand what's going on in this passage of Romans is Paul's laying out an argument in Romans. The first 
half of Romans, Paul's just laying out the gospel in beautiful and profound ways. And uh, so what he does in the first chapter of Romans is he lays out, here's, he's showing, here's how all the pagans are sinners so that his Jewish readers would be like, yeah, get those pagans. But in the second chapter, Paul will then go on to say, here's how all you religious Jewish people have sinned against God. And you too are without excuse. So that he gets into Romans 3 where he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in this, we have a tendency to, again, point fingers at other people. It's like, oh, look at those pagan sinners. They're not like us religious sinners. And, and there's sins that, that are common to those who don't know God, and there are sins to common to those who put on the appearance of, of religion on the outside. And so we need to be aware of that, that I, I think this doesn't apply just to the pagan sinners, but to everyone, how our mind and the corruption of sin transforms us so we then start living out that sin and broken and, and destructive ways that is destructive to our own souls and destructive to the community of God and destructive to the world around us because what we do is we suppress the truth of God with a lie. And honestly, I think our sins are the same as Adam's. We want to reject God and the truth about God because honestly, we want to be like him. We want everything we say to be right. How many times have I been in a disagreement with Jen and I wouldn't lay down arms just because I knew I was right and I wanted to be right? And how many times has all of us done something like that where we want to place ourselves in the throne of God? We suppress the truth that it is God who is sovereign and not us. And so we put ourselves on that throne. I love the image of uh, those of you who have watched Lord of the Rings, the, uh, the image of Lord Denethor and Minas Tirith. He's sitting on this little chair in front of the throne of the king, and he's reigning Minas Tirith like he's the king, but in reality, he's only put himself on the, this puny little throne, and it's become a, a mere um, parody of what he was supposed to be because he saw himself in the place of the king. And isn't that what we do? We build our little chairs and idols around the throne of God. And instead of putting God on our heart, the throne of our hearts and the throne of our community, what we do is we put little chairs around and we begin to worship those little chairs. We, what's worse is we sit in those chairs and expect people to worship us. And we see this, this, this desire to place anything in the throne of God as a other than the one true creator God of the universe. We want to put anything in his throne but him. And this is, is a profound root of sin. This is what Adam did when he took the apple. He thought he could write creation better. And so he thought he would be like a God and took something that did not belong to him. Next it says, we do not honor God. Amelia just had her birthday this past week. Now, when I was thinking about it, it's like thinking, it's kind of like, imagine through Amelia this huge birthday party, you know, zoo animals and bouncy castles and they even had like jets flying overhead with like paratroopers jumping out and it was just this amazing party you know she got everything she wanted you know all the video games and and, and candy and everything else and and at the end of the day when the party is all cleared up if she went whoa look how great i am i'm so wonderful woo honor me she would have missed the point <laughs> She would have missed the point. What she should, have, should do in this hypothetical situation, because there was no, um, all of that, it was just a, a good party and Amelia did it well, but um, is, is instead it's, wow, mom and dad, I'm so grateful that you did all of this for me. That you listened to my wants and desires and you showed me your love. 
for me. And we demonstrate honor to God by showing him gratitude for the wonderful things he's given us in all seasons. The wonderful reality of his presence in, in all seasons, in the good seasons, and especially in the hard seasons. God is present with us. But I fear that it is too easy that, to fail to honor God in the way he, we should. That in, especially in the, the good moments, but even in the bad moments, we begin to make it all about ourselves. Another birthday party thing, I saw a clip of, on the YouTubes where um, this girl got a, a Tesla car for her birthday. And you know what she did? She didn't say, oh, thank you, mother and father, for spending all this money and getting me a Tesla car. She's like, I don't like Teslas. Oh, I can't believe you got me a Tesla. <laughs> but don't we do this to God? When he's taking us through seasons where it's difficult, but we are getting more of his presence, God's saying, I'm doing this wonderful thing in you. I'm doing a pruning work in your life, and it will be wonderful. Just trust me. This is not a curse, but a gift, but you just have to wait to the other side to see it. Or he gives us the wonderful moments, and we make it about ourselves. And we start complaining about all the things that aren't just right about the way that God has done these things. And what we do is we fail to honor God for the beautiful reality that he has never left us. He has never forsaken us. He has given us all of himself so that we can uh, have new life in him. And we honor him by giving him all of ourselves. We want all, give up all of ourselves for all of Jesus. But when we fail to do that, we dishonor him. We say, oh, your gift isn't good. Or we say, your gift is all about me. When in reality, all of creation is all about Jesus. And if we miss that, we dishonor God. And then we will do the third thing that this passage points to, is that we exchange the truth uh, says, let's see, I'm going to read it. So, Then we'll exchange the glory of God for another. Let's see, I'm missing the verse. Yes, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. And so we, we exchange the worship of the one true God for idols made of our own image, our own ability to lift. We talked about it last week, the, the Israelites, what did they make as soon as they came out of Egypt? They didn't go to the mountain and sit there waiting to hear what the proclamations from God is through the servant, God's servant Moses. Instead, they went and built their own calf, a golden calf that they could lift, a glory that they could control. They exchanged the image of the immortal God they exchanged the beauty of the immortal God who's in that moment causing Mount Sinai to shake and they're sitting there making a, a, a weak little golden calf out of the gifts that God had given them. And that is what we do when we... That's what we do because of the root, core root of sin. I believe that we, we, this idolatry, this refusal to see who God is, this desire to um, suppress his truth with lies, his desire to um, uh, create our own gods, is at its root, the sin, it is the deep root of sin. That this is the root of sin. That we are broken and sinful people and our roots are broken and sinful. We need, this is the beauty of the gospel, is that we need God to come. We need Jesus to come so he can transplant our trees. He's going to graft in his roots. 
He's, he's going to take away the sin, those broken roots and give us his righteous roots. But it is only Jesus that can do this. If we don't realize this, we won't understand the entire purpose of the cross. We won't understand the struggle we have with sin. We won't understand why sin will so easily grip and grab our hearts. It's because we, we long to put ourselves in the throne of God. We long, we, we are a people created to worship. Even the, the most strident atheist will talk about the universe in worshipful terms. Like, I, I find it funny how much Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of talks in worshipful terms when he talks about the cosmos. And it's because we are beings created to worship, but when our sin is corrupt, when our roots are corrupt, we will worship anything but the one true God who created us to worship him and be in relationship with him. And what is God's response to our sin? To our capital S, sin. When we want those roots to go down deep into the corrupt soil, what is God's response? God says he gave them up to their, the, the lusts of their heart. The lust is... It's a very interesting thing that we would desire things that do not bring substance or wholeness. They are a parody, an image. It's, it's like I, I often have this dream where I am like super thirsty, like super duper thirsty. And so I'm like running around this dream looking for something to drink. And then I'll find a big pitcher of water and I'll guzzle the whole thing down. And as I guzzle the whole thing down, I'm more thirsty than I was when I first started. That I, I now am more thirsty, so I'm looking for more water and more water until I wake up and then actually go get real, genuine, true water that quenches my thirst. But here's the thing is, is, is when it says God gives us up to the lusts, our lusts are like those, that dream water that doesn't give any fulfillment. It is a perversion of the good created order that God has made. And so he gives us up to those things so that we begin to drink more and more and more of this empty dream water. It's like uh, in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the witch makes for Edmund uh, Turkish delight. I always wanted to eat Turkish delight because it sounded really good. But... Uh, not, not, not this Turkish delight, because as Edmund ate it, it, he became just intoxicated for it. All he could think about was this, um, this sin-filled, lust-filled delight. When it was a, a parody, it was a trap, it was a snare that stopped him from looking to the true, uh, to the, that which is honorable, and instead he... he ended up betraying his family because he was hungry over this Turkish delight. And that's what happens to us. God gives us up to our lusts, and then we begin to go deeper into our sin. It says, because they did not honor God. Yeah. <laughs> They did not honor God with their passions. And so what happens is, is they begin to honor themselves. It says that God gave them over to their dishonorable passions. Paul, Paul specifically referring, I think, or yes, but Paul specifically referring to sexual sin in this passage. There's something about sexual sin that when we deny God, sexual sin often follows along behind. I believe it has much to do with how God created the unity in the sexual act to reflect God in his image and his covenant relationship with his people. And when we abuse the glory of God and to diminish his image, we sin in ways, uh, in sexual ways. 
And God gives us over to these passions so that we crave them more than God. Essentially, what God's saying is, is, okay, you want these things to be your God? Go have at it. He's turning us over to the root of our sin. Now here's where, again, I want to point out that Paul will then turn this around. So it's easy to say, okay, look at how the pagans are living. They, their, their idolatry, their you know, sexual sin, the, 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 their, their, all of these things that they're doing. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's get those. But, but then Paul quickly turns it around and says, okay, here's some religious sins that come out of a result of having this bad root. And um, uh, Romans 2, 1 through 2, it says, therefore... You have no excuse. He's talking to the the, the religious Jewish people at the time. Oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And so what Paul is essentially saying is, is don't, don't get too excited to condemn those who have fallen into sexual sin, those who have fallen into the sins of drugs or the sins of, that we can commonly see, oh yeah, the, that person has fallen into a broken and destructive lifestyle. Because it's easy for us to then you know, start pointing fingers and saying, oh, well, let's get them. Let's get that community. Let's get those people. And in reality, Paul says, yes, but don't forget, it was the religious who sent Jesus to the cross to die. That, that we can, even in the church of Jesus, we can put ourselves on a pedestal. We can put ourselves in the place of judgment that doesn't belong to us. And then we begin to play, cast judgments to people that need grace. We forget that we ourselves are members of the kingdom of God because of the grace that Jesus gave to us. And so we need to see that those who are, who are trapped in their sin have been turned over to the root of their sin. We need to have a compassion and a desire for them so that we pray that, Lord, may those who are trapped in their sin, just like I once was, be rescued and saved and transplanted into good soil. Finally, God, the thing that God does is he gives the sinners over to their debased mind. Here we have the final conclusion because the debased mind does not acknowledge or approve of God. And God gave them over to that debased mind. Here's the reality. We live in our sins and have a mind so darkly clouded we cannot even acknowledge God. I find it incredible the, the beauty and detail of this life. The, the specific language coded in our DNA. The beauty of the Lenachia supercluster. The profound wonder of the double slit experiment in quantum physics and superposition. And that God knows all these things. He he knows the superpositions of up and down quarks. I can barely even say the words. And and God is aware of these beautiful realities. And we look at this beautiful complexity and we just say it happened on accident. You see, I think this is where we have been placing ourselves in the seat of God for so long that we as a people have been given over to our sin. We no longer acknowledge God. We no longer are even able to see him when we look at the beauty and the wonder and the perfect creation around us. Isn't that what it says in Romans here, that, that the natural order reveals the beauty of creation, and yet we still deny that there is a God. There's a, a book on the shelf that I've just been looking through. It's, it says... Uh, calls the Christian atheism. And, and it's not just those who declare 
that they are atheists, but it's also many of us who are Christians live as if there is no God. We might with our lips say, oh yeah, there is a God, but the way in which we go about our lives demonstrates that we don't really have a strong conviction that God actually makes a difference in our lives and that he actually did anything. And so God gives us over to the root of our sin. We have no hope unless God does something. Because our roots are so deeply planted in the soil of sin, kind of mixing my metaphor a little bit, but one with it, uh, <laughs> that, that, that we are sucking up so much of the, the nutrients of sin the, 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 that there is nothing we can do. Apart from God, the good farmer coming and transplanting us from that ground into clean soil, giving us new roots, which is something that only God can do, and placing us in a new situation. Are we able to have freedom from this? In Romans 12, 1 through 2, um, the Apostle Paul writes this. After, so after all of the, up to the Romans, he's laid out the whole gospel about how, how Jesus came to die for the Jew and for the Greek and for the, the, the religious center and for the pagan center. And he's made us all one family under Christ. He comes to this line on how we should live it out in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So I think Paul's giving us an image of this transformation of the mind. I'm mixing the metaphor in there a little bit of, the, uh, of being planted in new soil. That we begin to suck up new nutrients. That even our roots are new so that they know how to suck up good nutrients. So that little by little, the fruit on the tree begins to transform from unhealthy uh, fruit to whole fruit. That through the process of pruning, the, the fruit on the tree then fall off and are replaced by whole good fruit. Um, but before we get there, we have to remember that no one is exempt. You're not exempt, I'm not exempt. We are all sinners and we are all need, in need of this radical transformation of grace. And we cannot do it on our own because of the capital S, sin. Because of the way in which the corrupt roots of our soul have dug deep into corrupt soil. And apart from a work of Jesus Christ in our lives, we can do nothing. And he did a work on the cross so that we could be made whole. So we are dependent on him. It is necessary for him to act in our lives. It is necessary for Jesus to be placed on the throne of our hearts so that, again, new life can grow. So again, the big capital S sin is at its core is a corruption of our thoughts, passions towards God. Now we look at lowercase s sin and sins, plural. And these are the actions that come from the corrupt root of sin. So as we were talking, the fruit. So my arm's a branch, right? And I have apples all over my arm because Amelia loves apples. So <laughs> um, we, if the tree's roots are in bad soil, the fruit that is produced will not be healthy to eat. When I was growing up in Pittman, New Jersey, there was a, a lake called Alcyon Lake. And uh, in the 60s or 70s, there was uh, 
a, a landfill called the Lapari landfill that had chemical waste and they didn't properly store the chemical waste and it seeped into Alcyon Lake and the lake became contaminated. And any plant growing around that lake was cancerous if you ate it. And if you swam in the lake, it was cancerous if you swam in the lake. And, but those plants on the side of the, if there was a tree sucking up that water, sucking up the water from that contaminated soil, it could only produce fruit that could kill. It might not look like it's killing right away, but after a period of time of consuming this fruit, you would begin to feel the effects of that fruit. And that's what happens with our actions. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, The good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That our actions are an outflowing of the deeper parts of our soul. And when our roots get transplanted, when we get new root system because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that's our salvation. And then God goes to the work of sanctification, which is pruning the branches and plucking off the contaminated fruit. And sometimes... I'm not a bit of, I, don't, I have a brown thumb, I'm not a green thumb, so I don't know this specifically from my, uh, my own work, but I know that there are some plants that to prune them right, you have to chop them down to almost nothing. And sometimes that feels like what God has done to us when he prunes us. But then what grows out is this brilliant, beautiful, fruit-producing tree. And so what we're going to look at now is some of the fruits of capital S sin. We're going to look at the lowercase s sins that result from them, because Paul will continue on talking about that. And so in Romans 28 uh, verses, uh, or verses 29, yeah, I'll just start at 28 through 32. And this is what the Apostle Paul writes. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to their debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are all gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Through, though they know God's decrees uh, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but to give approval, approval to those who practice them. We're going to look at this list now. And we're going to kind of walk through it, but we're not going to hit all of the pieces of them because that would be another three sermons. And um, I don't think we have the time today for another three sermons. So um, what I'm going to do is kind of hit some of the highlights. But I want to, as you think about these things, I want you to see how all of these fruit of sin are connected to the corruption in the soul. That these, these actions, they aren't just actions unto themselves, but they have been fed from corrupt roots. And again, it is only through the process of being saved, being transplanted, being given new root system that you're able to grow good fruit in the first place. And then it is the work of Jesus to begin to pull off the bad fruit and so that through the Holy Spirit you can grow new, good, wonderful, whole fruit. So, But we're just going to look through and see a couple of these and, and then um, we will, that's the remainder of the sermon will just be looking at some of these fruit, these actions of sin that take place, so that as we see them, what, what, what is the, the, the reason we do this is so that as we see them, as we see the, them in our own hearts, in our own lives, <clears throat> in our own actions, we're able to say, that is a, a fruit of sin. That is a fruit of my old self, and I need Jesus to come and prune it off of me. I need it to be cast away. We don't want to feed off of those corrupt fruits. Again, mixing my metaphor a little bit. Uh, but we want to have them gotten rid of, we want to get rid of them so that good fruit can grow in its place. 
when we are planted in the soil of the gospel. So the first one we'll look at is envy. Envy is a silent killer because it looks at the success of another and craves that success. It's easy to look at as a congregation, look at other churches around, look at, look at how Beartown Alliance is doing. And we look at Beartown Alliance and we're like, ah, oh, man, why, why do they have such good things? Why did God bless them in such a way? And then we start craving their thing. And then we start doing things to either, to, um, to either mimic them, that we begin to idolize them, that we begin to make them the, the thing that we follow, or we begin to sabotage their, their name. And we, we say, ah, oh, Beartown Alliance, I don't know about them. I like Beartown Alliance. I like Dave. He's preaching a really good sermon right now. I am 100% certain of it. But what happens is, is when we envy one another like that, what we're doing is we're turning. We, if we did that, we aren't doing that. But if we did that, we would turn Beartown Alliance into a god. We would, we, would, we would say what they're doing is exactly what God has called us to do. But if God had called us to do exactly what Beartown Alliance had done, he would have just had us all go over to Beartown Alliance. Instead, he's called us to be Maranatha Bible Chapel. He hasn't placed us in Corning. He has placed us in horse heads and big flats. Though we have influence in Corning. So, um, <laughs> and Elmira and everywhere else. But, but there's a specific calling that God has given to us as a congregation to this place, to this location. And we need to be asking that question. Okay, what is that, that you have called us to, Lord? We want to pray and, and, and glorify God for the good and wonderful things that are happening over in Beartown Alliance. We want to praise God for their success. We want to pray for, for uh, Dave and the pastors over there that they, would, that they would have conviction and power to preach the word of God. And, and so that we, we want to be aware that, that envy is easily creeps up into our hearts. Sometimes it happens when that other person gets the promotion and we don't. Or when somebody gets that new PS5 and we, we haven't gotten it yet. Or any number of things. We need to be aware that this, this tendency in our heart to want what other people have even though it hasn't been given to us. And so when we see that when we see that, we will say, Lord, this is the fruit of the, corrupt, the formerly corrupt root of envy. Please pluck it off and cast it into the fire so that the good fruit of celebration and love for one another can grow. Gossip is another fruit of sin. I always find it interesting that gossip and murder are almost always in the exact same list. That gossip essentially is just murder with our mouth. That we kill relationships, we kill congregations, we kill friends and family with our mouth. Gossip and slander. And so it talks about gossip and slander. So the difference between gossip and slander, gossip's done in secret. It's like, pss, pss, pss. Do you hear what so-and-so did? Oh, yeah, you can't believe that so-and-so did this. Or it's like somebody tells you a secret that, or gives a confession, and instead of holding on to that and taking it to the Lord, what do you do? You say, oh, do you hear what so-and-so, their sin they were dealing with? And in, in Senegal, the, they use the French word that we would translate murmuring, that there's murmurings in the congregation. Oh, Oh, we need to pray for so-and-so. How many gossips have used prayer requests as an excuse to fuel the, the, their, their desire of gossip, to cultivate the sinful fruit of gossip? We need to be aware of what's going on in our hearts. Are we saying these things because we genuinely want to build up the person who we are, who we are talking about? Or is it we just love that the way, 
There's something about sin, and there's something about gossip, the way it tastes just so good. It's like a Turkish delight. You just want to keep eating it and eating it. And, and, and before you know it, you've destroyed somebody's life. You've ruined somebody's name. You've broken a friendship just because you wanted to say words about that person. I have seen congregations. I've felt the effects of gossip in the way that it destroys the community of Jesus Christ. So it's my desire that we would never be a church that loves gossip. Instead, that we would take our concerns to one another. That we would be confidence who'd go to God with one another. That we would build one another up with our words instead of tearing each other down. So let us be a church that loves one another because of our love for God. Next is it says, haters of God. And this one you may say, wait, wait, wait. Don't we love God as a church? I love God. Yes, I do think we love God as a church. But sometimes what happens is we get so enthralled with the idea of God that if the genuine God of this world were actually to show up, we would be terrified and not very happy about it. We like the idea of having God on our side, but when he actually shows up to, to convict us of our sins and draw us nearer to him, we're like, oh, time out. You're actually doing work in my life. I'm not sure I want to do that. When God brings people into our lives who need the transforming work of Jesus, need somebody to walk alongside them in that long road through salvation and sanctification, are we willing to walk, find those people and walk alongside them, especially in their brokenness? And because that's where we'll find God. That's where we'll find God transforming others. That's where God will transform our own hearts. Or are we just like the idea of God? Oh, that's something that happens in the newspapers. Don't, don't mess up our, the way we do it. So it's very easy to get in that way. It's very easy to get into our comfort. And God says, I got something amazing for you, but you're going to have to go through this journey with me. And, but when we refuse to go on the journey with him, when we refuse to go into those dark places where we will find people who are lost, we essentially are saying, we don't trust you, Lord. And we become haters of God because we failed to follow him. We failed to see him be as beautiful. We failed to trust that he has the ability to transform lives. We failed to believe that he has the ability to transform my own life. Or we were just too terrified that he might actually do it. And so we need to be aware of times where we, where we maybe like the idea of God, but hate the idea of actually following him. And when we find that fruit, we pluck it off and throw it away. Another one is, is heartless. This is one of those words that it's, it's funny because in the, uh, um, some words are very difficult to translate, um, especially in a list, because in a list, they don't have the same context. So there's the ESV, NIV, and KJV all translate this word differently. One says heartless, one says no love, and one says without natural affection. The, the, the Greek word carries with it the idea of a, the affection a, a parent has for the child. And it's interestingly the same word we get stork from. Um, and I like the uh, use of, I like the King James translation of, of natural affection. But, uh, or without natural affection, but, but heartless also sums it up as well. It, it comes to us from a lack of forgiveness. When we see people struggling, we begin to get the idea of, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And then we begin to write people off because it's too hard to walk alongside them. If God 
were to bless us with a mission to people struggling with addiction, do you know how hard it is to come out of addiction? People, you, you, it's why Jesus put in there, if somebody comes, your brother comes, sends against you seven times and comes and asks for forgiveness seven times, you need to forgive them seven times. It's because it is nearly impossible. It, it, apart from Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, it is, it is a very difficult task to get out of addiction. And it is a long road, three steps forward, two steps backwards. And if we abandon people too early, then there is a work that is missed that God wants to do in their lives through that back and forth wrestle out of that addiction. And so we need to be patient and long-suffering. And we can't write people off too quickly. And we need to have this love. I pray that we would have the love that, that God has for his people, for his children. It's my desire that we would be a church that loves those who are hard to love. That we would be a church that sees broken people and knows that apart from Jesus Christ, that is who I am. And that we would be willing to be the tools of God's pruning through that long but beautiful work that Jesus wants to do in their lives. Here is why we must go and ask God to be judicious in the pruning of our sin. We must fight against our desire to have sin grow. You can't have a pet sin. And here's why. Pet sins attract other pet sins. And then your house is full of cat pet sins, so... I <laughs> When one of these sins grow, the remainder of the other sins grow. I, I, I find it funny that people get surprised when they look at like Amsterdam and, and, and they say, oh, all the drugs and everything is legalized there, so there shouldn't be any crime, right? And crime is through the roof in those places. In one of the states out west, they, they decriminalized all drugs. And instead of bringing down the crime, it actually increased the crime. To the point that they're going back and saying, well, that was a mistake in trying to reverse that, that decision. Sin breeds sin, and this should not surprise us. And the other thing we need to worry, be aware of is, is we didn't fall into sin by accident, but because we love sin. It's interesting, in France, they, on all the cigarette packages, they have... Uh, pictures of people with like cancer on them or they'll they'll have just these horrific pictures and people smoke like chimneys in France even though they have that reminder this is what's going to happen if you smoke these cigarettes regularly and 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 why do they do this because they love it they don't care what the warning is they want to go into their sin so we need to be aware of this. We need to seek God. We need to be able to say, Lord, I need you to do the pruning in my life. I need you to be the one who chops out that sin. Lord, make that, that thing that I once desired tasteless to me by showing me your glory. Showing me the beauty of your presence. Showing me the reality of who you are. And that's why I, I, I love that we are celebrating communion today. That in this, we see the antidote to sin. We see the transformation uh, or the, the, the gift. We proclaim the gift that was given to us so that we may have that corrupt root of sin transplanted and that we could have the fruit of sin pruned off. 
so that we could live new lives in Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection we have hope for eternal life. That we have hope to be freed from those sins that uh, ensnare us. See, this is a hope-filled proclamation, and next week we'll get into even more of this hope-filled proclamation because in truth, this, the reason we, we, we spent so much time on sin today is because we will see the beautiful realities that Jesus Christ is the one who saved us. That even though we felt lost, it is we have freedom in him. And so Jesus gave us this reminder. He took the piece of bread on the night he was betrayed and, and held it up before his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat, eat and remember me. So today, as a, as a form of confession, as a form of asking God for forgiveness, asking God for, for new life, we take this communion together. So let us eat and remember Jesus. Same night, he held up the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink, drink and remember me. So let us drink and remember what Jesus did for us. Lord Jesus, we need you. Fear that this message is heavy. Lord, and without your grace, it is, it is a weight on our soul that we cannot lift. But I thank you for your death and resurrection, Lord. That it is not us that have to lift this burden, but you, Lord, who lifted it on our behalf. You took it away, Lord, and gave us new life and your righteousness. So I ask, Lord Jesus, that today that we would be transformed from broken people who have the deep roots of sin, Lord. And may we be transformed because we are given new roots, new soil, Lord, and you are pruning us too so that we may produce your fruit. Lord, help us to produce your fruit in abundance. I pray this in your holy name. Amen.